Hi, good morning and welcome to this future landscape of data privacy session, which is the third of our three summer sessions where we've been looking at key data privacy issues for businesses and organizations. Um, I'm David Goodbrand, a partner in technology and commercial division of Bernice Paul and head of our data privacy practice. And it's great to see so many familiar faces logging on and have joined us from previous sessions together with some new names and faces. So welcome all. I think there's a few other people just joining, but we'll, we're going to, we've got an action packed session. So we're just going to kick off just now. Um, as we know from previous sessions, data, data privacy is a topic that's relevant to all businesses and organizations. And this is only really going to increase as more and more businesses embrace cloud, digital transformation, and the ongoing move to online. Coupled, I suppose, with the realities of us all working more flexibly and in ways um, which we didn't perhaps anticipate a few months back. Data has for the last few years been seen as the new oil, um, but just like oil, it can be an asset if it's used correctly or a liability if things go wrong. So during the, the sessions to date, you've heard from our experts across the firm um, who've looked at different aspects of data privacy law. We've looked at lessons learned from COVID. We've looked at the importance of data privacy impact assessments and also some cyber risks. We also, in the last session, looked at uh, regulatory updates on data transfers and the recent SHREMS 2 decision, uh, e-marketing and data sharing. But today we're going to look forward. We're going to consider some of the data privacy issues that are likely to have greater prominence in the future. So I'm joined today by four fantastic speakers from across the firm, from our technology and commercial team, our employment division and dispute resolution team who will guide you through some of the future data privacy issues. Uh, so Callum Sinclair, ha say hi, Callum. Morning, everyone. Hi, Callum. Um, Callum's a partner in our technology and commercial team, and he's going to look at the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, Scott McGeechee. Hi, morning, all. Hi, Scott. Um, Scott is going to look at some of the data privacy issues relating to new tech sectors, uh, in particular health tech and fintech. And we've got Grant from our employment team. Morning, everybody. Great to be with you today. Grant is a total expert on subject access requests, and uh, he'll be looking at DSARS and practice and some lessons learned. And finally, but not least, we've got Pauline McCulloch from our dispute resolution team. Morning, Morning everyone. everyone. Hi, Pauline. And, and Pauline's going to look at some uh, risks associated with, with class actions. So, again, each of these topics would probably justify a session in its own right, but we'll aim to give you a flavour for each, um, which does remind me actually that the employment team are actually running a series of seminars on DSARS masterclasses that are coming up shortly, which you may find of interest if that floats your boat. So more on that one later. So just a reminder that we're using the chat function for questions. So please feel free to ask your questions in the chat function and, and we'll try and our best to address these as we're going through. Um, and if they can be framed in a more general way, rather than tackling bespoke questions, that, that helps as well. So without further ado, let's crack on and bring in Callum, if that's OK, who's going to kick off the conversation by looking at um, the, the rise in AI. So Callum, maybe if you can just kick us off by just reminding us what is AI and how, how would you define it? Sure. Thanks, David. And uh, good morning again, everyone. Um, so there are a number of different definitions, but broadly artificial intelligence refers to systems that are designed to perform in human-like ways. They may, for example, mimic the human ability to learn, uh, to reason and to deduce. Uh, the term AI encompasses computing concepts like machine learning, speech and natural language processing, as well as robotics and autonomous systems. And the term AI can be used to generically describe both the technologies used to create smart machines and the properties of a system with characteristics we would associate with being human-like, uh, like the ability to recognize visual images, interpret speech, translate languages, learn by example, and make decisions based on a range of different information. If we think about uh, the, the cliche that David used in his uh, opening uh, section there, the data is the new oil, it follows that as oil is processed to refine and derive value, the same is true of data. But rather than refineries and pipelines, AI and machine learning will be the key components and systems which will derive value from data. Basic AI and machine learning principles were conceived as far back as the, the mid-20th century, 
and there have been a few false starts, but the past decade has seen a huge acceleration in the effectiveness and application of AI. And one of the most commonly cited examples is Google's uh, DeepMind AlphaGo program, which can wipe the floor with the world's best human players of a game so complex that some thought that machines would never be able to play it effectively. And today's compute power and storage have made possible some of the conceptual thinking around AI. And, and given the exponential explosion in, in unstructured information and data, that's just as well. Some more controversial applications um, of AI from a privacy perspective include face recognition technology uh, in a variety of fields, including policing and security. And in healthcare, researchers, governments, and health organizations are looking at AI as a tool to bolster, bolster the fight against a whole range of medical conditions, including COVID-19, as, as has been mentioned in previous sessions. From a business perspective, a recent survey carried out by Salesforce on enterprise technology trends identified AI as the technology most likely to impact business, with 83% uh, saying that AI is transforming customer engagement and 69% saying it's transforming their business. So clearly a lot of food for thought there. So how is the law keeping up to pace? What's the law saying generally in relation to AI technologies? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, there's there's no overarching law applying to, to AI technologies. Um, it covers such broad subject matter that the current law is a bit of patchwork. Uh, AI can be problematic from a legal perspective in, in a number of ways. It has no legal personality. You, you can't prove intent of AI systems, and it can also be difficult to establish jurisdiction. So the response of current laws could be unpredictable around the world. Contracts will certainly have a role to play in regulating responsibility and liability for AI systems up to a point. Uh, insurance may provide some other protection and risk mitigation, but policies will need to be evolved or designed specifically to address some of the issues that AI presents. And concepts like vicarious liability, uh, as an employer can be responsible for the actions of its employees, for example, and strict liability, that being liability despite no uh, intent to harm or actual negligence, may have a role to play in creating liability on the part of AI systems designers and developers and those who, who train and deploy them. Interesting. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of chat about ethics and ethical issues associated with AI. Can we just ch ch chat us through some of those issues? Yeah, I mean, the ethical issues, including privacy, are, are amongst the most important to be considered when it, when it comes to, to the AI debate. Uh, Elizabeth Denham, the UK Information Commissioner, stated, for example, that ethics is at the root, root of privacy um, and is the future of data protection. Uh, and like physical systems, AI systems need careful design and constant monitoring to ensure optimization and to avert issues, even disaster, from, from arising. In AI's infancy, we have to ask ourselves, how much is that actually happening? You know, are we designing systems with that in mind? And how are we ensuring ethics by design, arguably just as important as privacy and security by design? In other words, what are the rules and, and who decides and, and what are the implications of those decisions? That's part of a much wider debate around the trust economy and, and technology, which is playing out across the world's largest economies at the moment. The European Commission, for example, has said that the benefits of AI can only be fully realised if citizens trust and buy into the technology. And ironically, many of the ethical issues arising with AI derive from very human flaws. For example, algorithmic bias, and the example I often give here is, is you know, try typing baby into Google and you'll get pictures of lots of bouncing happy white babies, which is what Google's algorithms think a baby is. Um, profiling and automated decision making, you know, those, those same system biases leak into areas like credit worthiness checking and even law enforcement profiling think crime in, in minority report. And, and you may have seen the recently upheld appeal against South Wales Police use of AFR locate technology um, on human rights breach of privacy grounds. And as yet, as far as I'm aware, Police Scotland have been unable to turn on their Glasgow um, automated face recognition technology. And there's so-called black box decision making, you know, and a lack of transparency and accountability if decision making is entirely devolved to systems without any human involvement. In the human machine interface, there's already a blurring of lines with chatbots and, and IVR and interactive voice uh, systems. Um, you know, is it right that I don't know when I'm speaking to a person and when when mm -hmm. a system? Um, you know, the so-called Turing test is passed when when at the point where I can't tell the difference. 
data monopolies are concerned, if, you know, if data is power, and um, it's likely to be increasingly problematic if that power is concentrated in a small group of very large organisations, you know, be they governments or, or US tech giants, and certainly the UK uh, Competition and Markets Authority and European regulators are taking an increasing interest in the latter. And the cyber threat posed by hacking and malicious training, um, which was best illustrated by the corruption of the Microsoft a chatbot, um, again a commonly used example, which was corrupted within a very short time from launch in the West, quickly taught to be an instrument of, of hate speech. And is there, a, is there a real threat from runaway AI or is it actually just science fiction? Well, in the AlphaGo example, the evolution from the original AlphaGo Zero, uh, from the original AlphaGo to AlphaGo Zero was, was incredible. Um, so, um, I think AlphaGo Zero, the, the, the latest evolution, ultimately beat the original 100 games to zero when it started to play itself, as opposed to playing from, playing and learning from human players. And that's not a great leap to, to Skynet and Judgment Day. So these, these ethical issues and, and others and how to deal with them have been flagged in a range of reports um, from governments and research organisations. At a European level, uh, this was kicked off by a consultation by the European Commission on Ethics Guidelines for Trustworthy AI, which culminated in a report published in April 2019. Yep. This focused on three fundamental principles. Um, AI systems must be lawful, they must be ethical, and they must be robust, um, both from a technical and a social perspective. And there were seven uh, key requirements for AI systems human agency and oversight, which, which was about appropriate human involvement, technical robustness and safety, which was about resilience and security of these systems, crucially, privacy and data governance, which is about the quality and integrity of the data fed to these systems and processed by them and legitimised access to that data, uh, transparency, which was about the traceability, explainability and communica uh, communication of decisions, Diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, which was about avoid, avoiding unfair bias, uh, societal and environmental well-being, uh, and the premise there was that AI should be for the benefit of all humans, including future humans who are not yet born, and, and accountability, where, where, which focused on appropriate mechanisms for responsibility for those, for those decisions and outcomes. And the guidelines also contain an assessment list for opera, operationalizing and, and implementing AI systems which is very recently, as recently as last month, been, been updated to, to a second version. Uh, the European Commission, through its high-level expert group on AI, also recently followed up with, with an AI white paper and a report summarising the public response to the consultation on that white paper. And it also launched a public consultation on an inception impact assessment regarding a proposal for a legal act, um, a legislative instrument laying down requirements for artificial intelligence. And that impact assessment complements the white paper by further analysing the relevant policy options and instruments. Um, and stakeholders are invited to submit comments until the 10th of September 2020. So you've, you've, you've still got plenty of time to do that. Um, four options were proposed in that impact assessment, each taking a stronger and more interventionist line than the, than the previous, um, as alternatives to a baseline of reliance on existing legal frameworks, which was felt to be um, was felt to be uh, suboptimal. And the options included a voluntary labelling scheme for AI tech and applications due to allege a, a full legislative instrument um, establishing mandatory requirements for all or certain types of AI. And when the consultation closes, the Commission is expected to present the proposal for a legislative framework on artificial intelligence during the first quarter of 2021, and we'll wait and see how Brexit potentially impacts on that or the end of the transition period. Meanwhile, in the UK, there have been a number of other reports and guidance from the UK government in 2019 um, and the House of Lords Select Committee in 2018, among others, um, touching on some of the same issues and guiding principles. But ultimately, in practice, the answer as to who makes the rules and who has responsibility for ensuring that we develop AI systems on an ethical basis is all of us. Um, legislators, developers, users of these systems, everyone if we get that right, then, then Scotland and the UK can be a world leader in ethical design and, and derive serious competitive advantage. Get it wrong, uh, well, there was a great cartoon uh, flowchart doing the rounds of social media about strong AI and where all roads effectively led to the annihilation of the human race. 
that doesn't sound like a great outcome. And obviously, um, algorithms have been hot in the press recently with the exam fiasco across the UK and uh, some of the biases built into these. So they, these are very much live issues. So we'll probably hear a lot more about these issues in the next few while. So building on that, um, what has the UK ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, said about AI from a data privacy perspective? Yeah, the, the, I, the ICO has been closely monitoring the in AI as well, and, and enabling good practice in AI was identified as one of its key priorities for data protection during COVID-19 and beyond in, in Elizabeth Denham's blog um, in May this year. Its so initial guidance published as far back as, as March 2017 on big data, AI, machine learning and data protection, the ICO made six recommendations which were consistent with GDPR, which essentially boiled down to considering anonymization, so does it need to be personal identifiable information, uh, use of digestible privacy notices to ensure transparency, conducting appropriate privacy impact assessments to identify and mitigate privacy risks in advance, uh, embedding privacy by design in AI solutions and projects from the outset, developing and adhering to ethical principles, a set of tools and principles which will be effectively a reference point, a moral compass throughout AI projects, and then ensuring auditable algorithms um, employing internal and external audits to, to check for bias and errors. And, and a few weeks back, following extensive work with the Alan Turing Institute, which was, has already actually worked with the UK government and AI, among others, the ICO published a uh, brand new guidance on AI and data protection. And that guidance clarifies how you can assess risks, the rights and freedoms that AI can pose from a data protection perspective and the appropriate measures you can implement to, to mitigate them. Uh, it contains recommendations on good practice for organisational and technical measures to mitigate AI risks, and it highlights that, that retrofitting compliance really works. Um, it does not provide um, broader ethical or design principles, and some of the other reporting does that, but it, rather it corresponds directly to the data protection principles. So part one of that guidance focuses on the AI-specific implications of accountability, um, including data protection impact assessments and mapping the AI supply chain uh, to determine the controller and processor responsibilities. Part two covers lawfulness, fairness and transparency in AI systems, which includes looking at how to mitigate the potential discrimination um, to ensure fair processing and establishing clear legal bases for processing at each stage of the AI development and deployment process. Part three focuses on security and data minimization, so examining the new risks and challenges raised by AI in these areas, uh, including ensuring effective tracking and managing of, of training data, end-to-end uh, -end security, including by separating AI systems from, from wider organizational IT where appropriate. And, and finally, part four covers compliance with individual rights, uh, including ensuring that meaningful human input is, is given into decisions and for solely automated decisions, uh, ensuring appropriate human review with, with training for staff as appropriate. So it's it's clear from the ICO reports and the other reports I've mentioned that there's an interplay between data ethics and certain key GDPR principles when implementing and deploying AI technologies, uh, in particular principles of fairness, transparency, data minimization and accountability. For example, AI is often most effective when you've got a huge data set to examine um, and to, to use to train systems. And that may be at odds with principles of data minimization, you know, about only using the absolute minimum personal data necessary, and retention only keeping data for as long as necessary. And it may also be difficult to set and adhere to retention limits if AI systems require historical data in order to function properly. So ultimately, when it comes to embedding privacy into AI systems, probably the best advice at the moment we could give is to follow up to date um, ICO, UK government and EU guidance, and to take advice if you're unsure. And we, we recently helped uh, one of our larger tech clients, a global hyperscale cloud provider, for example, to reconcile some of the differences um, between the Commission's ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI with, with similar but not identical concepts in GDPR. Um, and the Commission's assessment list um, for trustworthy AI, as, as updated very recently in July, is an extremely useful voluntary checklist to ensure compliance with fundamental rights, including privacy. And you know, if anybody's interested in links to that, then do drop me a line. Um, in most cases, when implementing or designing AI systems, you'll be obliged by law to complete a data protection impact assessment. And your DPIA will be a key compliance tool when considering processing personal data using AI. 
Yeah. I'll ensure you're thinking about the issues in risks and advance, which in turn will help you to design and build compliance systems from the outset or to implement um, third party systems and effectively audit those. And finally, be mindful of enhanced individual rights for data subjects under GDPR and how they might relate to AI systems. You know, rights of information, access, rectification, erasure, rights of restriction of processing and data portability. And these could be exercised by individuals at various stages in the life cycle of AI systems, from gathering and using training data through to predictions made uh, during deployment and, and results of those predictions. Plenty of food for thought there, and data protection impact assessments is something we touched on at one of the earlier se uh, sessions as well. So, uh, by all means, have a look at that one if you're interested in that. Clearly, a AI is going to be a much bigger topic going forward. So, now uh, I'm just going to move forward. We're going to bring in Scott, who's going to look at some data privacy issues associated with new and emerging tech. And um, Scott, uh, yes, uh, David, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the key privacy issues in relation to fintech and health tech. All of these are both growth areas, especially in light of COVID-19 and changes in behaviour, such as the increasing use of telemedicine. Firstly, we'll look at fintech. When we talk about fintech, we're talking about a wide range of different activities and players. For example, this would cover new and innovative startups and larger tech companies that operate new platforms and apps to enable individuals to manage their finances, accounts and payments more efficiently. This would also apply to the activities of established banks, financial institutions and insurance providers that deploy new technologies to, to deliver speedier and more personalised services to customers. For example, this may include the greater use of um, automated services such as robo-advice and automated decision making in relation to customers, such as for loans or insurance policies. So Scotland has got a really strong fintech sector. Um, and, and and growing and growing, so a number of a number of startups and established businesses. Scott, as you were mentioning, what would you say is the most important data privacy issues for companies operating in the fintech sector? Um, I, I would say, David, the most important data privacy issue in in this area is um, ensuring data security yeah. and being able to take measures to protect against the risk of a, a data breach. With fintech, we're dealing with an individual's financial details, account card details, and transaction history and a vast range of other types of personal data, potentially including sensitive data, which could be revealed um, by an individual's payment history. If there is a data breach in the fintech sector, particularly a cyber attack, there is an increased risk that the breach could lead to identity theft, fraud, um, or an individual suffering direct financial loss. In, in the event that um, a business operating in this area is made aware of a data breach, it's first necessary to assess the level of risk in relation to the breach and how it will affect individuals. If the risk threshold is triggered, then the breach has to be reported to the ICO within 72 hours after becoming aware of it. There are also separate cyber incident reporting requirements for the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, where there is a high-risk breach, um, which may be likely to occur in the fintech sector when um, people may have to take action to protect themselves and their position, it may also be necessary to notify individuals directly. Um, if a serious data breach occurs, um, and there's a failure to put in place appropriate data security measures, this can lead to a fine being imposed by the ICO, up to €20 million Euros or 4% of global turnover under the GDPR. There is also the risk of class action claims for a data breach, as Pauline will mention later on. In order to address this risk, the best thing for fintech businesses to do is to take preventive action by putting in place sophisticated data security measures in accordance with best industry practice. It is also important to have policies and procedures in place for responding to data breaches. This will help to buy crucial time in a fast-moving situation. This is an area where we have been able to help um, clients in the fintech sector in the past. Yeah, I think data breach and cyber attacks is a fact of life now. It's about how you how you you react to them and what, what systems and processes you put in place to prevent these things from happening. So, Callum mentioned um, AI and automated decision making. Um, so, just wondered if if you could have a wee think about that from a fintech perspective. What are the data protection risks associated with some of this new activity? Yes, um, and and fintech in, in particular, we're seeing greater use of automated services. This allows companies to provide services to a wider range of customers and respond more quickly. It also reduces the overall costs for the business. For example, one rising area is the use of robo-advice to assist individuals with their own financial planning. However, a risk arises where a fintech company uses automated processes to make decisions about an individual in circumstances where this has a legal impact 
or similarly significant impact on, the, on that individual. For example, this can include automated decision making about the award of a, a bank loan, which could have a significant impact on an individual, including on their credit score. In relation to car insurance, this could also include, include the use of black box technology to monitor a driver's behaviour for the purposes of making automated decisions about the cost of their insurance policy. Under Article 22 of the GDPR, the general principle is that it is prohibited to make a decision about an individual that is based solely on, autom on automated processing, where the decision has a legal or significant impact on that individual. However, Article 22 is subject to a number of exceptions that are relevant for the fintech sector. In particular, this type of processing is permitted where explicit consent is obtained or where it is necessary for the purposes of the performance of a contract with the individual. However, in these cases, the controller of the fintech company is required to implement measures to protect the individual's rights and freedoms and their legitimate interests, including at least the right to obtain human intervention, to express their point of view, and to contest the decision. Accordingly, before a fintech company seeks to implement a new technology which involves this type of automated decision making, um, where it's got a significant impact, it's important to carry out a DPIA and also put in place measures to ensure that it's possible to achieve compliance with Article 22, including measures which allow for human intervention or review. Yeah, I think that's that's important, bearing in mind what Cal was saying earlier about some of the risks associated with AI and decision making. So, I mean, fint I think that, that's been great fintech. We're going to move on to maybe look at health tech, which is clearly a massive growing area. Um, uh, and we've seen lots of activity in this space over the last uh, six months in particular. So what range of activities does the, the sector cover and, and what would you say are the key pri privacy issues in the growing health tech sector? Yes, um, so when we talk about health tech, this covers a wide range of activities. This includes the use of apps to monitor and record health issues. This would also cover wearable devices, which are used to monitor health levels and assist with medication. For example, um, such devices are used for managing diabetes. In addition, this also covers telemedicine services and apps, which can be used to provide health information and also to remotely connect individuals to health professionals. As you, as you mentioned, David, it's likely we'll see further growth in the use of health tech services, especially in light of um, COVID-19. Um, the use of health tech, uh, health tech raises a number of important data privacy issues. Um, I'll not mention data security, as this has already been addressed in relation to fintech. However, data security is a key area for the health tech sector as well. Um, so in this case, we're talking about health data. This is a special category of personal data under the GDPR which can only be processed under strict conditions. In the majority of cases involving health tech services, it will be necessary to obtain explicit consent from the individual in order to lawfully process their data. Uh, the GDPR imposes onerous requirements on obtaining explicit consent. This must be an express statement of consent, which is specific, informed, freely given and unambiguous. It is necessary to ensure that GDPR compliant processes are put in place for the collection of these consents through any health tech technology. And it is also necess necessary to keep a record of all such consents um, for GDPR accountability purposes. Um, importantly, um, it's necessary to ensure that the health data is only used in accordance with the purpose for which it was collected and not for any other incompatible purposes. And a further key issue is transparency. With all health tech services, it's important for providers to be truly transparent about what types of data they're collecting, for what purpose they're processing it, how it will be used, how long it will be retained for, and if it will be shared with any third parties. This information should be brought directly to the attention of individuals and the privacy notice, and the information should be made easily accessible by them. As this processing is high risk in nature, because it relates to health data, it is necessary to review all of these issues in advance as part of a data protection impact assessment. This will help to support GDPR compliance and identify any issues of particular concern at an early stage in the process of developing health tech services. So I think data sharing is a, an issue, a topic we touched on in the last session. It's obviously um, one where it really plays to the trust of individuals as well. So, um, so in relation to health tech, what are the key issues in relation to data sharing um, help with health data in particular? And um, and also sort of the commercial aspects of monetizing whatever you're doing. Yes, definitely. Um, as we are dealing with 
health data here um, in, term, in order to share it with a, a third party. Um, because of the it's a special category of data, you'd be required to obtain explicit consent um, from the individual before sharing it. This is likely the the only condition that would apply in in most cases here. Um, it may be difficult in practice, however, to obtain uh, this type of consent from an individual to data sharing. Um, in addition, um, if, if you were to go down this route, it would, um, it would have to be in line with the purposes for which the data was collected, and you'd have to comply with transparency requirements by identifying the categories of third-party recipients of the data at the outset, including that information in the privacy notice. Um, in terms of commercial value, it's clear that health data is, is very valuable and has high commercial value. Although there are restrictions on shared health data, which relates to identifiable individuals, the GDPR does not apply to the sharing of anonymised data. As such, anonymisation may be an option here where health data is extracted and anonymised such that it, is, that it is no longer possible to re-identify any individuals. There may be high value attached in a data set um, based on this type of health data, which can be used um, for the purposes of improving, improving our understanding of health issues and helping to create clinical advances. Although it should be noted that there are some difficulties in achieving true anonymisation in practice. Um, if you're looking to engage in monetization um, by including advertising within a, a health tech app itself, um, it would be best to do this through contextual advertising based on the context of the app. Because if you were to do targeted advertising based on um, targeting advertising uh, in light of an individual's specific health data, you'd be required to obtain explicit consent from the individual in order to process their health data for marketing purposes. And it would be difficult to obtain this type of consent in practice. Similarly, it would be difficult to lawfully share um, health data of individuals with third party marketers or advertisers for marketing purposes. Um, this raises the concerns mentioned above in relation to third party data sharing. Um, however, it should be noted that a recent FT investigation last year found that most healthcare websites have been engaged in a form of unlawful sharing of users' health data with marketers and advertisers for marketing purposes without obtaining the required consents. And this um, practice has also been identified in a 2019, 2019 ad tech report issued by the ICO. And this is an area where there may be further regulatory action in the future. So we've, we've looked at fintech and health tech there, and even just those two emerging tech sectors, you can see that there's a, quite a number of different data privacy issues and considerations uh, to, to think about. So uh, thanks very much for that, Scott. And um, I think we're going to ch change um, uh, focus and, and, and move over to the very popular subject of data subject access requests. Very popular because I think we've seen um, a, a, quite a, a big rise in uh, DSARS, as they're known, in in the last few few weeks. So, so Grant, um, I think you're going to lead us through the next session. Do you want to sort of take us back to basics uh, first of all, and just remind us what our subject access requests? Sure. Thank you, David. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the, the concept of DSARD subject access requests. And um, in essence, what they are is a request that an individual makes to have sight of the personal data which an organization holds about them. So um, for myself, the employment team, you know, the space that we're advising in, it, typically we see these requests come in from employees, former employees, getting in touch with their employers, wanting to see um, what information is held about them, what personal data is held about them. Um, there are two sides to subject access requests. I think first and foremost, the individual is entitled to receive copies of the personal data um, that they're requesting. And secondly, they're also entitled to mandatory information, which is set out in the GDPR about how that personal data is used and managed. So things like what is the data used for, who it might be shared with, how long, and the organization is going to keep hold of it. And um, subject access requests, they're not a new right that individuals have. They've been part of the, the data protection framework in the UK since the 1980s. But as David has touched on, we've seen a, a real marked increase in the, these rights being exercised really since the advent of GDPR coming into force. I think there's been that greater awareness of data rights. And I think Fundamentally, you used to be able to charge a fee if somebody um, made a subject access request. And I think the fact that that fee has now been removed by the GDPR has maybe taken away a bit of a psychological barrier to people yeah. making these requests. You know, it's almost a case of saying, I've got nothing to lose. I might as well put this request in. 
I think in addition to the increased number of these requests, we've also seen them becoming increasingly complex and time consuming to deal with. And a big theme already this morning has been the increased volume of data that is held about individuals digitally. And I think the increased volume and data that organizations hold about individuals mean that it's not just a, a click of a button to deal with these requests. It could be quite a time consuming process. I think it's further complicated by the fact that very often these requests are not made for data protection reasons. You know, the reason this right is in place is for people to check that their data is being used or managed correctly in accordance with data protection principles. In reality, certainly within the employment space, it's almost a bit of a, a pre-disclosure exercise where an employee is maybe thinking about um, employment tribunal claims or other kind of litigation against their employers. They're looking for that silver bullet email that's going to make their case. And I think that backdrop makes it all the more important that these requests are dealt with carefully. Um, and as if that wasn't challenging enough, um, the expectation is that organizations can comply within a, a one month time scale, which um, often proves pretty challenging in practice particularly at the moment with everyone working from home and remotely and all the rest of it. So clearly DSARs um, have a, a big impact on in the employment space, but they, they, can, they can apply to all um, data subjects. So I wonder if you could give us some practical advice on, on, on how you've been dealing with subject access request grant. Sure. Um, well, I think certainly from an internal perspective, I think first and foremost, I think it's important to make staff aware of subject access requests and be able to identify them when they come in. The, yep. the one month time scale, it, the clock starts ticking as soon as the, the DSAR kind of hits the desk as it were, whether that's an email coming in from um, the, the data subject, whether it's a, a letter making the request getting dropped off at reception, the one month time scale starts then. And it's really important that the request gets diverted to the, the individual, whether that's a data protection officer or um, a HR team who are going to be managing the, the process of responding to the request. Yeah. Um, the position of the ICO, um, UK's data protection regulator, is that any request an individual makes for their data should be treated as a subject access request. It doesn't matter the form that it takes, you know, you don't have to um, make reference to the GDPR or the Data Protection Act, any request for data is going to be interpreted or should be interpreted as a, as a DSAR. And to, to give an example of that in practice, one situation which we were involved in advising on, an individual had made a request for information as part of a, a grievance process that they were going through. And the individual specifically said in the request, could you provide this information? Otherwise, I'll be forced to make a subject access request. So by their own words, they were saying, look, this request I'm making isn't a subject access request. Ultimately, it got referred up to the ICO and the ICO's view was, look, regardless of the words used by the individual and the fact that they were holding out the request is not a subject access request, it should have been treated as such. Right. So I think given that broad interpretation, I think staff being able to identify a subject access request, getting it passed on to the appropriate team is, is key. I think secondly, looking to involve your IT teams at a very early stage in the process, you know, in responding to these requests, there's always going to be an element of having to carry out some degree of IT searches, whether yeah. that's for emails, electronic documents that an organization might hold, and IT will be able to give you a steer on the appropriate search parameters to be used, whether there's a requirement to go back and request further information from the requester. Um, I think having their involvement is key right at the outset. And I think also, lastly, what can be really, really helpful, and we've seen a number of clients do, is to almost introduce a DSAR action plan, which sets out um, you know, the different roles and responsibilities in responding to these requests. You know, very often, it's going to be a, a cross-departmental effort, perhaps, you know, if we're talking about an employee's request between maybe a HR team fronting the request, liaising with the requester, IT carrying out the searches as we've touched on, and perhaps a legal team carrying out the review of the material before it gets disclosed to the requester. Um, that action plan can maybe also have a bit of a protocol around what the organization's approach is when it comes to disclosing certain categories of information also. 
Got it. Um, and, and, and I suppose the IT team's involvement is, is crucial. We're seeing a lot of uh, new tech, tech tools, and I know you, 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 um, you use a few tools to help um, various things as well, which, which is good. I mean, that, that, I suppose coming in to the one month time frame, which is obviously um, uh, quite a challenge, I would imagine, for a lot of businesses to comply with. How has COVID-19 impacted on that, would you say, Grant? Yeah, I I think kind of fundamentally, you know, the one month time scale is challenging at the best of times, much less, you know, when you're trying to deal with remote working and, um, you know, perhaps having less people available to deal with these kind of requests. And um, I mean, the GDPR specifically provides that organizations can extend the period for responding to a request where it's necessary to do so. Um, and I think in light of COVID, we see more and more clients rely on that extension, you know, just taking into account the challenges of remote working and perhaps not having the same resource to deal with the request. And um, the ICO has actually been very sympathetic to that. I mean, it actually says on its website, you know, when you go into its frequently asked questions about subject acts requests that it understands organizations are going to take longer to respond. And it said, look, if People get in touch with us complaining about the amount of time it's taken to respond to a request. We're likely to say, look, what do you expect? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, but, you yeah. know, there isn't the same availability there. I think what I would say on that is if there is an intention to rely on that two month extended period, it's important to engage with the requester on that and to let them know just as soon as possible um, just to manage their expectations and again, reduce the likelihood of any um, attempt to escalate the matter further. Um, and I think as well as keeping the requester appraised of the time skills for dealing with the request, um, it's also helpful to speak with the requester to, to clarify, look, what exactly is it you're interested in? You know, very often we see these far reaching requests, um, you know, for all personal data. And very often it's actually only a very focused, um, you know, material that the individual is looking for and um, so i think trying to work with the requester on that and um, can also be a really helpful step it's interesting you mentioned it's like, I suppose engaging with requesters particularly when perhaps it might be um related to a litigious matter or just mm. a, a, a employment cream sounds good in practice but you know is it possible in reality it can be a bit hit or miss, to be honest david you know i think certainly um there have been occasions where it's actually been really useful to do that and we've got a lot more clarity from the requester but i think with the best will in the world sometimes people aren't willing to you know to make that they might have numerous reasons for that and you know they might insist on that request going back multiple years and while the ico's view is that organizations should make extensive efforts to look for the data requested there is an appreciation that organizations should be required to take disproportionate steps to comply with the request so it might be a case if you're facing that request where you are looking back a number of years, maybe a long serving employee, you're talking thousands upon thousands of documents potentially. Um, it might simply be a case of saying, look, we haven't agreed this with the requester, but we're just going to take a narrower, we're just going to apply a narrower scope to this request. You know, we might yeah. use narrower search terms. Um, you know, the individual might have asked us to search against initials, nicknames. We're not going to do that. We're just going to focus on items that contain their full name or, you know, otherwise focusing on a particular time frame, maybe the last six months worth of materials, as opposed to going back over the full span of their um, you know, employment or former employment, as it might be. And um, while that might be open to challenge, the requester could say, well, you haven't fully complied with the request. I think it's, you know, I think that's a legitimate approach to take in a view to not be disproportionate in how you're dealing with this request and any sort of assumptions or narrower scope that's applied, a record should be kept of that just in case there is any challenge at a later date. Good stuff. And talking about some other practical um, uh, advice, are there any circumstances where subject access requests can be refused? Um, there are there are two two main ways set out in the GDPR. The first is where the request is manifestly unfounded, um, and the ICO has defined that as a situation where there's no basis for the request at all, or the request is only being made for nuisance or disruption purposes. So situations where that might arise is where the individual has made a subject request, they've made a DSAR, 
but they offer to withdraw it in return for some sort of benefit. Um, or where the individual has maybe made clear, I'm doing this just to cause maximum chaos, um, or maybe otherwise as part of a bit of a systematic campaign to sort of, you know, throw a spanner in the works and to, you know, cause disruption, you know, perhaps submitting a new request every week or something like that, yeah. um, where it's not being made in good faith. Um, secondly, and this is perhaps more common, or well, a more common um, application in practice, it's where the request is manifestly excessive. So either in respect of the amount of information caught by the DSAR or in respect of the number of requests. So there's been an excessive number of requests made after each other um, where it would be deemed to be excessive. I think importantly, you know, there will be you know, there will be a need to make sure if you are relying on either of those situations that your your case for refusing the request is as strong as possible and um, because it's inevitable that a complaint will be made to the ICO on the back yeah. of it if you're refusing the request entirely. So I suppose steps that I would recommend before refusing um, the request is perhaps seeking to engage with the requester, trying to get you know clarity on the information that they're looking for, um, trying to understand what's the, the reason for the request, because um, that's going to put you on a stronger footing for saying, look, we've tried to be reasonable here and we're not getting anything back from the requester. It's going to put you on a stronger footing for refusing. And I think particularly when we're talking about the excessive requests, I mean, there isn't a, a threshold defined by the ICO or the GDPR where you're going to meet that excessive mark. But I think if you've got a notional IT search of saying, well, if we were to fully comply with this request, we're going to be talking this many thousand emails um, to go through. In our view, that's excessive. Um, I suppose a word of caution, and this is again just from our experience over the past couple of years since GDPR came into force, is that the ICO has tended to be quite requester friendly when it comes to the yeah. um, sort of the interpretation of these um, grounds for refusal. Um, so, you know, I think it's worth bearing that in mind. Um, I mean, we had a situation where to fully comply with the request, our client was going to have to review over 500,000 documents. The ICO wow. maintained that that was not excessive. Um, I'm still of the view that that was the wrong decision. I don't think that's correct, but I think that's an indication of you know the fact that organisations should maybe be slow to completely refuse a request and should take maybe some um, steps to towards compliance, even if it's just provide, providing a, a narrower scope of material asked for. Wow, there's 500,000 documents. That sounds like a bit of a nightmare to tr troll through. That's where these technologies comes into play. Grant, I'm, I'm aware there's probably lots more we could be saying about these. Sure. Uh, but um, you, you, I'm right, you've got a, a, a separate session coming up in September on, on DSARS. If anyone's uh, interested in a further in-depth analysis of, of DSARS, um, check out our uh, social media channels and invites for for that, so I I think Grant, I'm going to move on um if for for um to to Pauline um for the the final part of the session um and Pauline um uh, there's been quite a lot of chat recently uh, in the data privacy context about class actions, data breaches, group litigation, mm -hmm. etc. Could you maybe just start us off by talking about what do we mean by group litigation in this context? Yeah, sure. Um, so there are there are many terms that you hear used: group actions, class actions, collective actions. And while they all operate slightly differently across various jurisdictions, they all involve the bringing of a claim on behalf of a group of claimants who have the same or similar claims, whether that's by the circumstances leading to the case or the law surrounding it. I think for or historically, when people would think of a group action or a class action, the image of US legal dramas pops into their heads. It's kind of long been considered a US concept, this sort of Erin Brockovich effect. Mm -hmm. of the concept has become increasingly prevalent this side of the Atlantic. We have court procedures in place. They aren't perfect, could perhaps be more efficient, but they do improve these with which claimants can bring actions. Um, and in fact, Scotland was particularly late to the party. Um, We've only just had a group procedure introduced in the last few weeks, as of 31st of July, so um, definitely lead to the party there. Um, and in terms of examples, we've seen and acted in uh, many high profile litigations under these procedures. The subject matter has changed over the years, but the risks and the issues remain the same. 
Historically, personal injury cases were most commonly mass litigations, things like coal mining dust cases and asbestos cases. Then came the kind of pharma and medical device sectors. They're very well versed in the risks. Most recently, we've worked on metal and metal hip litigation, pelvic mesh litigation. And now there's emissions litigation coming through involving car manufacturers. And of course, in the financial services sector, we've seen the PPI cases. So it's often said that the, the data privacy or data breaches will be the next PPI. Um, what are data, what, what, why are data breach claims susceptible to, to litigation in this context? Well, claims for data breaches are becoming more prevalent. You know, last week, I think we saw headlines involving the claims against Oracle and Salesforce. Proceedings are going to be raised next month eh, for third party sharing of data without consent from them. Um, yeah. And any data subject who sub suffered a, a breach of data protection has a private right of action against the breaching organisation. So this is distinct from any regulatory action. So it's an additional reputational and financial risk that any business would have um, to any ICO finer action. And like Grant mentioned in the context of DSARS, there is this increased public awareness of data rights. And given the number of people who can be instantly affected by one data breach, these are particularly susceptible to group litigation because you can have one act of breach which can then give rise to multiple claims and that makes it a lot easier for claimant firms to put together a litigation um, without undermining their, 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 their work that they would have to do um, because they're effectively running sort of several cases for the price of one incident. And the fact that data protection is regulated tightly and relatively effectively by the ICO makes it more attractive to claimant law firms when they're gathering claims you know there's, there's a potential for cases to be a bit easier to prove if the ICO action has already been taken, judging a defender to be guilty of the regulatory offences. Right. Um, and the fact that there's sort of the increasing tendency for PR pressure to result in firms admitting liability up front when announcing data breaches doesn't particularly hurt, hurt the case either. Um, we do tend to see data breach cases flowing from the outcome of an ICO fine. You know, in the case of BA, for example, they had a higher court action raised very shortly after uh, the ICO issued an intention to find notice. And then with EasyJet, their cyber attack um, from January resulted in a data breach just this year and group litigation has already been launched at, at, at the High Court in England. So it's, it's obvious that data breaches are providing fertile ground for, for these claimant law firms. Yeah, I think I, like maybe several other um, participants, got the email from EasyJet <laughs> saying my data has been breached. So uh, I've not joined the action uh, yet. I'm not. Uh, let's move on from that. But why is group litigation becoming so popular then, would you say? Well, generally, it's um, it's just good business. Funders are becoming very heavily involved in litigation nowadays. Um, they provide financial support in exchange for a percentage of the award. So it is very much just been seen as another investment opportunity and a potentially very lucrative one at that. Um, they'll usually cover liability as well for any adverse cost awards if the claim fails. So that removes the risk of any liability for each individual claimant. And just makes the idea of, of bringing a claim more attractive and, and less risky for the individual. Um, equally, legal fee structures now make it easier for claimants to obtain legal representation um, through no win, no fee um, or success fee arrangements where the solicitor's fee is calculated based on a percentage of the award made by of the award made by the court. And, and usually if there's if there's a an unsuccessful case, then, then there would be no fee payable. And these have been made much more accessible lately in a wider range of circumstances. And particularly where Scotland's concerned, this year brought in the introduction of success fees where they weren't previously available here. So that's had an impact. And then I guess more generally, there's been a focus on, on consumer rights more. Um, the Consumer Rights Act 2015 consolidated and enhanced a number of consumer protections. Um, in particular, it allowed for the creation of a class action procedure for breaches of competition law. Um, and that was a significant change because it provided for an opt-out procedure. Um, and an opt-out procedure as opposed to opt-in means that all claims arising from one set of circumstances are automatically included in the litigation unless the claimant proactively opts out of the case. So that obviously results in a significant increase in the size of the group, the value of the case, and as a result, the risk level to the business. Um, it also makes bringing a case more attractive uh, to funders who are considering to whether or not to provide financial support to a claim because it's, it's a more lucrative investment opportunity for them. Got it. Okay. And could this apply then to data breach claims? Well, there is an opt-out procedure 
already generally available in England, known as representative actions, but it's very strictly interpreted to require all claims to share this identical interest in terms of the claim and the loss which has occurred. Um, and that's kind of deterred the use of that procedure. Uh, claimant firms have opted for the wider scope which is provided for in the alternative procedure known as group litigation orders. And it's it's group litigation orders under which the BA case and the EasyJet cases have, are being litigated. Um, and the same would apply to, to other non-data ones, mesh and HIP and vehicle emissions claims. These are all under this kind of wider scope procedure. Um, however, there have been attempts to run uh, data breach cases under an opt-out procedure as a representative action. Um, the Lloyd v Google case, which some may be aware of, um, was one example that involved the Safari workaround where Google bypassed the cookie settings on the Safari web browser to place tracking cookies on the iPhones of 4.4 million users without their indiv individual knowledge or consent. Um, and the claimants here argued they shared the same interest in the claim and as a result the case should be an opt-out. Um, and that's significant because there was a sort of measly sum of £750 claimed per plaintiff, but that becomes far more significant when you multiply it by 4.4 million users worldwide rather than just those who have proactively signed up to a litigation um, in, in England and Wales um, or elsewhere in the UK. So Google argued that the fact that the different categories of personal data were breached among different claimants meant that they couldn't all have the same interest in the claim, so it shouldn't be an opt-out. And the, the court initially agreed with them. It went to appeal. The court agreed with the with the claimants. Um, and the matter's currently been referred to the Supreme Court to decide. So we'll wait with bated breath on that um, to see what happens. We'll hope for a decision towards the end of this year. Um, there was also a failed attempt to do this, uh, the same thing, by bringing claims against Equifax uh, releasing to its 2017 data breach, but that didn't progress. And actually, this morning in the news, <laughs> I saw that an action had been raised against Marriott's hotels for their data breach, resulting from a hack to their database between 2014 and 2018. And that would appear to be an attempt to bring this as an opt-out representative action off the back of the current status of the Google case. So th there, is, there, is, there is the potential for this to happen. Uh, the GDPR itself also does provide for member states to have this opt-out collective actions procedure specific to data breaches. Um, and the UK government opted not to put that in place when they were bringing the Data Protection Act 2018 in. Um, but the Act does provide for a 30-month review of the merits of doing this. Um, and that 30-month review period each year so between Supreme Court and the legislation, there is a very real chance that the already very real risk of data breach group litigation could exponentially increase with the endorsement of a, an opt-out procedure for data breach cases very soon. So to find out, Pauline, just looking at the time, what, what the companies can what can companies do to protect themselves and prepare for um, uh, such claims? It will, aside from obviously listen to Callum Scott and Grant's advice on risks and compliance with rules and requests, um, ensure your contacts, contracts are tightly drafted in terms of liability for data breach issues, regardless of what point in the contractual chain you're in, um, because there, there could be scope to pass on the risk there. Um, check your insurance provision, make sure you've got coverage for this scenario and check what areas you could be exposed in. Um, and if you think you are at the risk of a group litigation, whether through a data breach of your own or as part of a contractual chain, um, in England, claimants are subject to pre-action notice of claims, but the same doesn't apply in Scotland. Um, we would usually expect to see a bit of pre-action correspondence, but um, ultimately the rules allow for trial by ambush. Um, but the new group procedure does provide for use of the court's warning system in a group action context specifically. That's known as a caveat, whereby your solicitor is immediately notified of any t attempt to lodge group proceedings against your company. So that's something we can put in place as well if, if there's a concern. Great stuff. Um, thank you to all the speakers. We've 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 just reached out eleven there, and we've covered a lot of ground. There has been a couple of questions, a few questions coming in. Actually, I'm not sure whether we just have uh, enough time just to answer these. But what we will do is we'll take these questions off offline and come back to the particular um, uh, question question uh, posers uh, offline, if that's okay. But I just want to say thanks to everyone for uh, participating. Thanks for the speakers today. Um, data, the, the data privacy session has been um, a really useful one to focus in on key issues. There's clearly a lot of questions about specific 
um, um, areas that we've touched on. So I think we will, will look to do uh, more in-depth sessions on these individual areas going forward. But uh, have a great yesterday and thanks for joining us.